morning, Journey Church. Man, I'll tell you, I missed you, but I had a wonderful time. Man, I'm so excited. I want to share some of it with you. But first of all, I want to welcome the Alexander Campus. Amen. Woo-wee. Hey, hey, you know, you, you see this pink shirt. I wish Daryl could see my pink shoes that I... <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's, that's really the truth is uh, he can't see that. Uh, it's one of the few color shoes I don't have, but I got a 10 and a half D. I'm going to find me some. But anyway, let's talk about the holy shift to the holy land where the truth is the holy shift really started in the holy land. In fact, we started a series a few weeks back, and we started out how first week we started to talk about the shift in the power of God in Acts 1-8. And it said, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses. Man, I got to see the place where that took place. Unbelievable. So there's this new power that, that we have. We, we talked about the shift in boldness that we had in, in Acts 4.13. And uh, it said that uh, and, and when they had seen the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned men. They, they, with the boldness, was, they became so bold about Jesus. They, I, I saw somebody on Facebook this week said, have you been bold enough to invite somebody to church this week? Amen. So let's be bold this week. Amen. Woo! And, and then there was a shift in the boldness of how to handle problems. Because in Acts 4, 29, it, it talked about, it uh, said, grant yourself, your servant, boldness, even when people were threatening. So can I tell you something? You got a problem, you now got the power. Amen. Say, I got a problem, I got the power. So there was this new boldness on how to, how to handle problems. There, there was this unbelievable boldness in prayer. In Acts uh, uh, 4, 30 and 31, it said they stretched out their hands and they healed and there's wonders and there's signs of serve. But 31 said, and they had prayed and assembled together that was shaken. Man, wouldn't you like to pray in such a way that the whole place was shaken, that, that your life is shaken, that your job is shaken, that your family is shaken in such a way that they know that Jesus Christ is there and you're speaking in a bold way. So we talked about a shift from the holy shift to the holy land, but something I thought about this morning, when, when, every time you walk onto this grounds, it's holy ground. And, and when I first started preaching, I used to think it was my job to try to make everybody happy. But it's not my job to make everybody happy, but it is my job to bring a message every single Sunday that does not make you only happy, maybe, but helps you to be more holy. And when I say but I'm holy, I mean I want you to be holy, so special to God that you're set apart and that God wants to use you like you've never been used before. Holiness means to be a totally devoted, dedicated to God where God can use you in a special way. Listen, I don't want you to just be happy. I want you to be holy. Amen? So let's kind of, let's move, man. I want you to see some of the things on this trip. But before I do that, I, I, can't, I can't forget what God's doing during the holy shift. We're in our fifth week now, and, and God, we've already had 69 new members, amen? Yeah. Woo! Baptized 29, that's 5.8 people every single Sunday since we began. We've had 37 people commit their Lord, their self to the Jesus Christ. We've had 165 visitors, amen? Yeah. And, and total this year alone, we've already had 137 new members. 42 of those from the Alexandria campus. Way to go, Alexandria, woo! Last Sunday, they baptized three, and they had people join. We baptized 110 already this year. Amen? Amen. I've got these little stickers. They're all over my office, and it says, let's celebrate 100 baptism in the year 2015. In fact, I had a plaque made, and I was so excited. I never want to forget where we came from, where we can't enjoy where we're at, and where we're going. This year, we've already baptized 110 and 20-something, 21 of those were from the Alexander campus. See, see, why do numbers really matter anyway? And numbers matter because every number, we're, we're in the life-changing business. Every number has a name. Every name has a story. Every story matters to God. And if every story matters to God and every name matters to God, it should matter to Journey Church. Amen? I, I love going to the Holy Land. It, it was a great experience for me. It was a great journey. And, but what I want to do is, I, I not only want to share it with you, but we had this, with this guy, his name was Boaz. Yeah. I have to think about saying that one. But anyway, his name was Boaz. And he was sharp, sharp. But sometimes we'd get, get real commercialized, and Boaz would say, look, look, everybody stop for a minute. 
Y'all sit over there and close your eyes and think about Jesus being in this very place. And let's read the scripture that was happening where you sat. Wow. That was something. What I want you to do today is I want you to imagine going on the journey. If there's anything that I want to do the last, they used to say the last half of my life is going to be the best half. Let's say the last quarter of my life is going to be the best half. But, but I want to bring you with me on my journey, my spiritual journeys, my physical journeys, my traveling journeys. I, I want us to, to journey together. So just imagine that that's what we're doing. Because see, I learned something there. I couldn't wait to get there. But I learned that, see, it's not the location, it's not the land, it's not even learning that brings joy and happiness. And see, I want to learn, I want to go to location, I want to see the land, but joy is a journey to seeking Jesus Christ. See, it's when we seek Jesus, we, we learn that, hey, it's not, it's not just the location. Though it had to happen at that location because it had already been prophesied that it would. It, it's not just the land, though the land was great. It was not just learning. See, in the, in the real time of the Holy Land, they had some learning of Pharisees that were way smarter than any of us. They could quote the first five books of the Bible. I mean, they had learned, but they didn't have a relationship. See, it was the love of Jesus Christ that made it there. It was his love for me and you. It was his love for the Father. It was in Mark, Mark 12 30. It says, For we should love the Lord and the God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind and all our strength. This is the first kind. The second one is the, the love of neighbors as ourselves. So, see, what I want you to know is, see, if, if you're not happy right now, you're not going to be happy if you go there. If you're not happy probably on your job, you're not going to be happy if you change job. Believe it or not, if you're not happy in your marriage, just because you change and get another marriage, you're not going to be happy. I want us to be learned to be happy where we're at. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 8, 17 puts it this way. I love this. I love those. God said, I love those who love me. And those who seek me, find me. I'm going to tell you, when you really love somebody, you do learn about them. I mean, who and what we love, we, we, we seek after. I mean, see, joy is not a matter of where we live. It's not a matter of where we travel. It's not even a matter of what we have. It, it, it's learning, <laughs> you really? It's learning to find Jesus everywhere we go and whatever we do. The Bible says in verse 18, riches and honor are mine, God says, to give. Where, where do riches and honor come from? From God. They're his to give. So are wealth and lasting success. Now, now riches and righteousness is great gain. But so often people seek riches as believing that it's going to bring what only the right relationships can bring. See, if we have the right relationship with God and we have the right relationship with our others, we got joy. See, joy is a byproduct of seeking Jesus and having a right relationship with him. But man, Jesus wanted a right relationship with me. He wanted a right relationship with you. But before that, he wanted a right relationship with the Jews. He wanted it with uh, Jerusalem so bad that we, we, we actually stood where he walked up and he looked out there and he said he wept. The reason that he's wept is he wept because he wanted a relationship with them. And I want you to know if you're here today, Jesus wants a relationship with you. In Luke 19, 41, it says, Now is he, Jesus... He drew near to Jerusalem. He saw the city and he did what? He wept over it. Verse 7, and then it says this, saying, if you had known, during church, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, today is the day for you. The things that make for your peace. Jesus said, man, Jerusalem, if you had just known, if you had just known the way to have peace in journey church, if you just listened, today could be the day that you have peace. But, now they are hidden from your eyes. See, the Jews to some extent are blinded to what Jesus did for them. But the days are going to come upon you when your enemies will build embarkments around you. Huh? They're going to surround you and close you in on every side. Can I tell you two things about that? Number one, the rejection of Jesus Christ always has a consequence. When, when Jesus calls you to do something today and you don't do it, there will be a consequences for your sin. There's a consequences for not being obedient. But you know what else I learned more than anything else? What, 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 what he said right there, I never knew. Until you got to Jerusalem, it's already happened. They're surrounded on every side. There's embarked. There's enemies. They want to destroy them. Let me, let me read you Luke 19, 42. 
in the Amplified version. And the reason I did, when you read the Amplified, it's almost like having a, uh, uh, a commentary. It says, oh, you know, all that you had known personally, e- e- even at least in these, your days, the things that make for peace. When he said the things that make for peace, he says, you know, for freedom from the distress that you're living in. That's the experience as a result of your sin. He said, Jesus was crying. He said, man, I want you to know the result of your sin is you're going to live a life that's unbelievably stressed out. He said, that's not what I had for you. I have the one. I wanted you to have peace. I want you to have security. I want you to have safety. I want you to have prosperity. I want you to have happiness. And, and, and it depends upon the right relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I show you a picture of us standing on the hill of Jerusalem? And my wife's standing there, and she has her hand out, and she's looking at at, at, at Jerusalem, and isn't it beautiful? I mean, my wife I'm talking about. <laughs> but Jerusalem's real cute. But, but what, what, I, what you can do now is, is you see the golden dome in the background. The golden dome, it was beautiful to look at, but really see, that, that's a Muslim mosque. It was built over the original temple. And what I want you to know, see, God said there's consequences for our sins. Jesus said, I wanted our people to be there. I wanted you to worship me freely there. But because you would not accept me, because you rejected me, I still protect you, I still love you, but you're missing out on the very best thing I have for you. We started walking, man. This is just overwhelming, you know, and, 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 and walked down the hill, and you could see the city, and it talked about him approaching. We saw a church, and it was called the Church of Tears. And it was a building, and it had teardrops on it. And it was the reminder that that's where Jesus wept. That he wept over Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is a type of those people that he loves so much, and he loves me and you. It's a type of the people that me and you should love, because today the church is the people. And when is the last time that you wept over somebody that you loved? Or when is the last time you wept over sin? When is the last time you realized that because of their sin, they lack peace and security and safety and prosperity and they're missing happiness? And they wept because Jesus said, I want a relationship with you so bad that he still does. See, Jesus knows that really that prosperity and peace and freedom from distress and happiness is only a result of having the right relationship with him. And it was then and it is now. Now listen, we're standing there, this is true, I mean, we're just standing there, it wasn't long, and we started walking down the hill. And we came to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in and, and the Garden of Gethsemane, he showed us a picture of an olive tree, he said, you know, that olive tree's been there 2,000 years. And he said, it's not only been 2,000 years, he said, you know, right over here is probably where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said, oh wow, he said, do you want to go over there? I said, man, do I want to go over there? He said, well, let's go over there and we got there and he said, do you want to read? I said, man, do I, do I want to read? I was a little nervous. You're almost overwhelmed. But, but I want to read where I was at the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 37, if we have it. Do we have the video there when I read it? It said, and when Jesus came to them and called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here for a while while I go and pray, and he, and, he, and he went with Peter, and he was two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful. And he, and he was deeply in distress, and he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Well, I'm sitting there standing in the Garden of Gethsemane getting to read this. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. And he said, stay here and watch. He went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed to his father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Well, it's still, you're just reading it. You can't even comprehend what's going on in your life. And then they said, then the disciples, the disciples uh, to them, they slept and with Peter. And he said, what, could you not even watch? And they, he said, watch and pray, unless you enter into temptation. They said, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said it a second time, and he said, Father, this cup can pass from me. But nevertheless, your will be done. He later on he went and he found him asleep again. He said a third time, and he did it again. And he went back to them and he said, Okay, sleep. But then he said, verse 46, he says, Arise and let us be going. The betrayer is at hand. Well, at that time we had stopped reading. But I went home and I started reading after that. In verse 47, it said, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve 
with the great multitudes of swords and clubs that came with the chief priests and the elders with the people. So guess what? Now his betrayer had given him a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one who sees him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi. And he did what? Kissed him. I'm not going to do a whole message on the Garden of Gethsemane right now because I am during Easter. Uh, but I do want to share some insights that I learned that I'd never seen it before. Sometimes doing God's will is the hardest thing we'll ever do in our life. I never saw it that way. I always say, man, it's the easiest thing. It's the best. Now, it is the best thing, but it's not the easiest thing. Jesus said, can this cup pass for me? I, I got up this morning, and I was talking about that this cup pass. Do you know it's the only time that I know that Jesus prayed and while he was on earth that God the Father didn't answer the prayer? And see, we have times that we don't understand. We feel like we're pouring out our hearts and we're praying to God and we feel like he doesn't answer. But see, God really did answer. He just didn't answer at that time the way Jesus in the flesh wanted because God had a bigger picture than that. So sometimes you make a choice to do God's will. It may be the hardest thing you ever do. But doing God's will brings the greatest rewards and the greatest blessings, but sometimes it's not on earth that it's in, in heaven. I'm so thankful that, that God didn't allow Jesus' prayer to be answered at that time. Because God was looking at it in the perspective of heaven, and, and Jesus, when he got in heaven, I'm sure he rejoiced with the Father, and he said, Father, I'm so glad that you didn't answer my prayer, and I'm going to tell you, when we get to heaven, there's going to be all these prayers that we're going to be thanking God, thank God that you didn't answer, because we didn't know the heavenly impact that it had. I mean, what if he had answered his prayer? We wouldn't have the death, the burial, and resurrection. We wouldn't have the power of God upon our life. We wouldn't have the strength, the security that we have. And we wouldn't have assurance of going to heaven, but we do. When we're living on earth, though, we got to remember, as Hebrews 13, 14 said, this is not our home. I'm just visiting down here. Now, when I get to heaven, I hope I get to come back and visit Journey Church. But th th this is not my home. I'm looking forward to my home that's in heaven that'll last forever. Uh, when making decisions, we need to base our decisions based on heaven, not just what we see here on earth. There, 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 I also said there's no greater hurt than being betrayed by somebody that you love. I mean, Jesus had just been in the upper room with the disciples. Now he's at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was with the people that he loved the most. He was the people that he poured out his life to. He was the people that were going to take the ministry of. And yet you see where Judas speaking with the 12 and the multitude, he said, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Can I tell you something? If Jesus was betrayed by somebody that loved him, you will be too. Fifth, remember this, we're most like Christ when we forgive those people who have betrayed us and hurt us the most. I mean, in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was talking about the people that put him on the cross. He was talking about me and you. I don't think Judas fully uh, understood the results, the consequences of his sin. So now here we are. We, we, we're at this top and we see the dome and we see Jerusalem. And we see Jesus wept over it and and that Jesus loves you and how bad he wants a relationship with you. We walked down to the Garden of Gethsemane and we talked about where Jesus prayed to the Father and the Father didn't answer him. He said the blood, sweat drops fell off of him. He was in such agony. And then we almost walked past this. We got out of there because, man, I was, I was, I was just basking in the, the Garden of Gethsemane and and we were walking down, and he said, you know, before we get to town, I want to show you something. He says, the field of blood. He said, y'all just look over there. So we almost walked past it. And one of them said, man, that's a message on greed. And I said, well, let's go back there a minute. We looked, and we took a picture. And I don't know if we have that picture or not. It's called the field of blood. If we do, it needs to be there now. But anyway, it says this. In Matthew 26, 14, it says, one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot. He went to the chiefs, and he said this. What are you going to give me to deliver Jesus to you? And they counted out 30 pieces of silver. And from that time on, Judas, he looked for an opportunity to betray him. But see, he got what he thought he wanted Judas did. 
So many people, they think, if I just could have more money, if I could just have more success, if, if that person would just do what I wanted them to do, I'd be happy. And so Jesus sold out. And people sell out all the time. And then in verse Matthew 27, verse 3, it said, And Judas, his betrayer, seeing what it had been condemned, he was remorseful. You know what I said? Too bad he didn't repent. He, he was remorseful. He was sorry that he didn't get the results that he wanted. He, he was even sorry what happened to Jesus. But if you read the story, he went back and tried to give the, 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 the silver to the people that he got it from. Boy, wouldn't it have been a different story if Judas said, man, I betrayed you, you're still going to the cross, but I shouldn't have done it. Jesus, would you forgive me? I'm sorry. Did you know that Jesus would have forgiven him? But he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So many times what we are is we're sorry that we got in trouble. We're sorry for the results, but we're not sorry for our sins. Verse 4, and saying, I have sinned, I betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what does that have to do with us? You see to it. Listen to this. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed, and he went, and he did what himself? Hanged himself. Sometimes silver and gold is not going to really give you what you think. Amen? But the chief priest took the silver and gold and said, uh, it is not lawful for us to put it into the treasury. Oh, no, it's lawful to pay somebody, to kill somebody, but it's not lawful as to that because of they are a price of blood. Now, look at what they did with it. <laughs> and they consulted together and brought with them a potter's field very in strangers and yet what they called it therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day wow i mean so we're walking by and they say that that's the field of blood i couldn't even comprehend it but when i got home i started thinking again silver and gold won't bring the results that we think we will oftentimes riches uh, over or uh, can't put riches before a relationship or it'll bring ruin or destruction in your life do you see see what what he thought that he could have silver he thought he could have riches but what he needed was a relationship and i see marriages i see families i see churches i see business i just said man if i just had more riches i'd be happy no if you had a better relationship with jesus christ you'd be happy and because of that people are making all kinds of crazy decisions and first timothy 3 9 says that says this but those who crave to be rich they fall into all kinds of temptations and snares of many foolish things and, 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 and uh, useless and godliness and hurtful desires. They plunge men into ruin and, and destruction and miserably and perishing. See, what I said, it, it's not the money, it's the love for the money. It's, it's the craving to be rich. It's to try to get your way. Yeah, listen, listen. I, I'm not going to preach on gambling, but I'm going to tell you, if you think you can gamble and get rich, you're wrong. I know, my, me and my wife, we got married, we didn't have a honeymoon. I went married to justice of the peace. I mean, I, I got married to justice of peace when he got my, back then you had to get blood, I almost fainted. <laughs> and then I worked my way back home, but it wasn't long. I, man, I want a trip. I said, hey, baby, this, this could be our honeymoon. And we went to Las Vegas and the MGM, and I mean, country come to city. I walk in, I'm taking pictures. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. First, they stopped me. They said, you can't do that. I said, man, but this is fantastic. I'm in Las Vegas, and, 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 and I wanna, I'm going to win a lot of money. And my wife, she said, you better slow down. I said, oh, honey, you go to bed. I got this. <laughs> well, back then, I didn't even have enough credit to get a credit card, so I brought X number of dollar cash, and I wanted to rent a car. So we'd rent a car. Thank God we had to put up a deposit. The next morning, she came down, and I'd lost all her money. Yeah, the wildest way to start a honeymoon. I didn't even want to tell her. I thank God, though, that we had put a deposit on the car. And I learned that, guess what? Riches isn't going to make me happy. And trying to get rich too fast the wrong way is going to bring misery. I'm not preaching against gambling. I'm, I'm preaching against letting gambling control you instead of you controlling gambling. There's some people that go to the casino, man, they can watch the movie and spend $20 and go home. Praise God. There's some people that are crazy like me and think you're going to really win. That is called stupid. 
I mean, you think they put on all these shows and build all these great things because you lose? What I'm trying to tell you is don't let something else control you. Don't make crazy decisions. How many people here today have jobs just because of what they think they can make in the money? There, there's nothing wrong with making money as long as you tithe with the money. I'm not, and nothing wrong with getting promotion. But if it takes away from the Lord and takes away from your family, what I'm telling you this, riches without relationship, are you ready, will bring ruin, destruction to your life. Second, betrayal always, you ready? Betrayal always hurts the person doing the betraying the most. See, when I read that, I thought, man, he, 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 he hurt Jesus so bad, which he did. He caused Jesus to be put on the cross, but he did. But the truth about Jesus, they couldn't kill Jesus. They killed him, put him in the tomb, and he rose again. Amen? See, what started out to be the greatest betrayal in the world ended up being the greatest blessing for me and you. And Judas, he went out and hung himself. You see what I'm saying? The people that betray you, and it hurts, and it should. But it hurts them worse than it hurts me and worse than it hurts you. So we got to learn to forgive those people. we got to forgive them where God can use us. we got to forgive those people who lied to us, that cheated about us, that talked about us, that betrayed us. Because really, what you'll learn, if you're careful, if you'll watch it from beginning to end, you'll actually feel sorry for them. I, I can remember the lady that embezzled um, hundreds of thousands of dollars from our company and we lost everything we had. And when we found out where she lost it, she lost it gambling. They said down at Marksville, they said they had a big picture of her in the casino. Big deal. I saw her about five years ago. It looked horrible. And she died an early death. Big deal. I would much rather have what I had than have what she got. See, what I want to tell you is, is, is people are going to lie about you. People are going to hurt you. People are going to betray you. Forgive them before they ask. Some people will never ask. It hurts them a lot worse than it will ever hurt you. So let me, let me give you some closing insights. Jesus loves you, and he wants to make peace with you. Don't allow sin and rejection to rob your peace, your security, your safety, your prosperity, your happiness, and joy. If you're here today and you don't have this peace and this joy, I'm going to give the invitation in a minute. And Jesus said, hey, that, that's what I was weeping about. I wept over Jerusalem because that's what I wanted for them. Later on, he said, I went to the cross because that's what I want for you. He said, I want you to feel secure in who you are. I want you to feel safety, and I want you to have peace, and I want you to have joy. Maybe you have a loved one that's been a long time that you know that they don't have this peace and this joy and this happiness, this security. Maybe you need to come today and come to the altar. Maybe you need to weep for them. Maybe there's a sin, and there's consequences for the sin. But today, you want to come and weep over that sin and ask God to forgive you. Third, maybe you've been betrayed or maybe you're the betrayer. If you've been betrayed, forgive them today. Because I actually feel sorry for them. It's worse on them. I know it hurts us. But in the long run, when we take care of it the right way, when we handle it the right way, no matter how bad it is, God can turn it into a blessing just like he did with Judas. Maybe you are the betrayer. Maybe you are the Judas. And maybe you're sorry, but maybe you hadn't got things right with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've allowed the guilt and the shame to destroy other relationships. And today, Jesus said, hey man, I came to die for people like you. Would you come and just confess it and then forsake it? And let me give you a new freedom and a new peace and a new security and a new hope and a new joy. Maybe yours has been silver and gold or money. And it's bringing destruction because you, of your job. You're putting your job over your relationship. Now, I think you should work, and I think you should work hard. But I don't think anything should come over your relationship with Christ. I don't think you're, anything should come over your relationship with your mate and your kids. And so how do you know? How do you know? On your job, are you influencing people for Christ? In your school, in your hobbies, 
See, are, are you just there for the money? Are you just there for the silver? Are you just there for the gold? Are you there for the God-given purpose that God has given you to make a difference, to further his kingdom? See, I don't know what's going on in your life. I know one thing. There's absolutely nothing too bad that you've done that God can't give you peace. There's nothing too hard that he can't give you a new start. So if you stand, let me pray with you and pray for you. God, you're such a great God. I thank you for this wonderful opportunity that I had. But God, I know it's just not a land, it's not a place. I know my joy and my happiness has come from a person. And I know that person is you. God, I pray for those here today that may not know you. And they want to come today. They said, I got to have this peace. I got to have this security. See, it doesn't matter what was going on in the world. It, it, it's, it's, are you focused on Christ? Maybe God's called you to join the church. Maybe he's called you to follow through in public baptism. Maybe he's called you to forgive somebody. Maybe he's called you to forgive yourself. Whatever God's called you to do, man, I pray this morning that you let him have his will and his way in your life. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.